for today. Well, welcome everyone. I'm really excited to be joining. Um, sorry for a little of a late notice. Um, I tried to put it on Instagram, but forgot to put it on the Slack. Um, so I'm sure we'll have some people um, sliding in here late, but um, really excited for today. Um, we've been doing these for about almost two months now, which has been awesome and just good time to hang out and catch up and um, see some faces and not feel like we have to isolate at home alone, but also to learn and whatnot. So um, there's a Slack link down in the chat. Um, if you'd like to join and haven't yet, um, if you got any questions or whatnot, we've been doing portfolio reviews as well. I think I paired out most of them. I got um, one, one or two people waiting for a couple, and, um, got names to link them with. But if you're interested in that, you can drop that there. And we've been doing speakers and really excited to have uh, Mr. Jose today, aka Fuzzy, Z Fuzzy Joe on Instagram. Um, just uh, one of the best guys and actually met him in San Antonio a few years ago and um, just become good friends, and um, he has some great stories to share, and I'm really excited to have him share his work. Um, so without further ado, I'll turn it over to him, and if you're not talking or don't have any questions um, at the moment, if you can mute your microphone so we don't hear random sounds and whatnot, but, um, and we'll open the chat after he does a little talk, and we'll ask some questions and kind of steer it. So without further ado, Mr. Jose, take it away. Hey guys, thank you for joining me. Appreciate it. Thank you for taking the time. Hey, Michael, do you mind if you keep your audio on so I just pretend like I'm talking to you? Yep, yep. I'll be here moderating the whole time. Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, let me start with, um, I'm going to ask if I can get the screen from you. Yeah, go ahead and take it away. Yep, all you. Uh, host disabled attendee screen share. I kind of need to borrow it. <laughs> How do I do that? Let me see. Called you out. Okay. Okay. Try it, try it now. Screen? Try now, okay. Here we go. Sweet. All right. All right. You got it? You see it? Yep, all good. Okay. All right. So I wanted to talk about, I mean, you get you've had, I guess, a lot of sports photographers, but you know, one of the things that we do that I do, since I'm most also not just a sports photographer, I'm also a um a newspaper photographer. And um here in the Bay Area. Uh, it's really unique because in the Bay Area, we have a lot of sports. We have football, two football teams. The Raiders are going to be leaving soon, so that's a blessing. But we have two ba major league baseball. We have soccer. We have multiple colleges and a ton of high, uh, a lot of high school. So, but one of the things I want to start out with, because I shoot also not just sports, I just wanted to start out to give you an idea of kind of the stuff that we do. And so a lot of the stuff I shoot here is spot news and fires. And so in this instance, is, uh, because of the fires we've had up in Northern California, um, we have to be able to shoot these events. So right here, these are just some small examples of kind of what we've been covering lately in the past years. Now, after this image, there's a really kind of a disturbing image of a, of a horse that was uh, caught in the, in the flames. If you don't want to see that, I'd turn away. I'll make sure, I'll just do it for two seconds and move on, okay? So uh, if anyone- You're good, no, you, you're good, I think. Most okay. People, yeah. Because the reason why I'm showing this is because a lot of the stuff that happens just to show you how horrible things are, it just moves so fast. Even mm -hmm. horses don't have a chance to escape these flames. And so a lot of the stuff is um, you have to be, you know, I have to be trained on all these things. So it's not just sports. I have to be trained and also just kind of like fire safety. And, and there's always a sense of kind of like, you, you know, being very respectful in these events as well and approaching people with utmost respect and asking them about permission to take their photos. So it's a whole different dynamic. And also spot news like this, where we have to run around and whenever we see something, and this was a weird accident at the time. And mostly it was because I was actually there for another event for an assignment. And I just happened to be there right when this happened. So it's crazy, but this is just kind of a small example of what we do. And homicides, actually, this is, this, is the, this is like the closest I've ever got to in a homicide where there was like a total of like, dun, dun, you know, like, oh, wow, this is intense. And they didn't kick me out. So Sacramento County, they just like, you can stay there. I'm like, okay. And of course, we have a lot of protests out here in Berkeley. But I love using the balance, and, you know, and design in the photographs and make it really well, you know, balanced. And rescues. And of course, sometimes I have to hide behind a garbage can for about two hours. Two hours. 
go in. But there's also the cute stuff that we also find, you know, in daily life that we shoot. So, uh, mother duck crossing the road. That's a cow. <laughs> uh, so, one of the things I really wanted to talk about was uh, just kind of like, as you notice, a lot of the stuff I'm shooting, there's not just, it's all different varieties. We have, to, have to be, we have to be really good at, you know, portfolio, lighting. We have to be able to get shooting, of course, nighttime photography, uh, food, features, and sports. So this is where I get into sports now. Now, when I first started, I mean, I used to, Michael, I used to like, at my lunch break, I would go out and take a roll of film and shoot on my lunch break and shoot basketball. Wow. So I had no idea what I was doing back then. And this is 1997. So I was basically a photo tech at a new, small newspaper in Antioch, California. And I worked from four to two in the morning. And so I wasn't allowed to run my film till after 1230. So I would, shoot, I would shoot a couple of assignments, not assignments, but just stuff I find. And then at the end, I would shoot stuff. And so one of the things I wanted to start out with is just basically right now is show you uh, these images of Steph Curry. But I wanted, this is a really kind of a unique image because when I first noticed Steph with his tattoo of his wife's name, Aisha, for the A, mm -hmm. I noticed that, and this is kind of like, I, I started out with this because this is, I photographed this in San Antonio the first time I met you. I had to wait for, the right moment to be on that side because it's on his left hand side. And so what I had to do is I can't get access to Steph Curry in Oakland on the left side. So I had to go on the road until he played on its on a court that the visiting team is on the left side on the bench. So I sat there and I waited and I waited with a 400 shooting it nice and tight. And that's how I got this image. Awesome. So it took a lot more planning than I thought. But I've been following him since he started in 2009. As you can tell, he's really, you know, tiny. His uniform barely fits. He's got no tattoos on. And this is, this is a portrait session we had with the team. Um, and this was a little bit of freaky for me because I was using a Canon camera. I shoot Nikon, but I was using a tilt focus Canon lens on this. And I was like... <laughs> I, I I had no idea how to shoot Canon, man. But it was it was fun, but at the same time, it's really stressing me out. And of course, this is a, his uh, famous shoes where he writes, "I can do all things." This is shot with a 400 with a teleconverter on the floor, and I'm guessing where I'm shooting. I'm actually the camera's on the ground, and I'm just focusing as fast as I can on the ground and zooming it left and right while he's running, just to give you an example. And um, I, this, I made this one frame and it was, it was perfectly because the, the darkness in the back was actually the part where the benches are and it was nice and black and it worked out. And you know, every other frame was completely out, but one frame, that's all I needed. And this is kind of like, when you shoot these things, it's crazy. When, when I first started covering him in 2009, nobody covered him. Nobody talked to him. It was easy, you had conversations with him. Now, whenever you photograph stuff, it's basically, this is the amount of people that are around him all the time. So there's a dynamic that you actually have to kind of work around that, especially when you're photographing them. Except for practices, when they have this open situation, uh, this is how it is. And so sometimes they let me get into practice sessions where I'm actually the only one in there, but because I've had a longstanding relationship with the Warriors, they open their doors and they let me in, which is really nice. That's awesome. And one of my favorite things to do with Steph is that I photograph him during the warmups and I always keep an eye on him because he always does funny stuff. And this is actually made, this photo was made in Toronto and he was, um, no way, I take that back. It's made in Portland. And it was the, one of the playoff games with his brother. And so he was a little nervous because he's playing his brother. So he's just sitting there having fun, just trying to loosen up. Now, this is like, someone's like, well, how'd you do this? And this was really kind of funny. This is this photo I made when I found out that he was blind, like he needed glasses. And so my job, I figured, you know what? I'm going to try to shoot the contacts in his eye. So I sat there after the game and I brought a 400 that game. And I went up to him during the television interview and I shot it with a four and a teleconverter. Mm. Right, looking straight, you know, as close as I can get. And it's, it's still a minimum distance, about three to four feet, four, about, around four feet. So I just had to sit there and handhold it and manually focus because, you know, he's moving, everything's happening, and the light's changing. And at the, the moment I shot the shutter, a bead of sweat came down, and that was, it worked out for me. 
great. And this is one of those instances that I want to talk to people about was um, when Steph is been, when this is the first game ever at Oracle where it was the official first game when he went on court. If you look behind him, you see all these photographers and videographers. One of the things I really want you guys to learn is when you're out here, you don't have to be mixed in with the crowd. I decided to say, I'm going to go on the other end and try to be a fly on the wall and wait for him to come out. And so I did. And I was able to make this frame and I was, I kind of stepped away from the situation because I was like wondering, you know, what do I, if I miss something? Because I think everyone's concern is when you shoot something different from everybody else, you might miss something, but it, you have to weigh out those options. And in this instance, it worked out for me, but to me, I'd rather risk losing a photo for, by, by trying something different than just getting the same thing again and again. Love that. And this was one of those instances where I always say, keep an eye out for everything when you shoot, especially like if I shoot something with my eyes. Steph, Steph isn't reacting to that because he made a shot in this photo. Steph is reacting because Clay Thompson made a shot and he's in the background if you could see him. But if you know Clay Thompson, Clay Thompson doesn't react at all. Clay Thompson is a machine. That is him reacting right now, that, nothing. So basically, since I've been photographing him for so long, I knew not to focus on Clay, but I went straight to, to, to Steph and it paid off. And this is one of those images that worked out. All right. um, one of the things also, remember, things don't have to always be two a a thousandth of a second. When you shoot sports, slow it down a little bit. Shoot it at eighth of a second, F8. Slow it down, make sure you have movement. And Pam, try different things. And this is one of those experiments that I tried where there was another shooter there and I was able to shoot differently and take care of that advantage and take advantage of it, right? So I didn't have to, if I screwed up, I screwed up, that's fine. And so this was in one of those instances where I shot at like, I don't know, F8, a 10th of a second on a layup with Ted Kevin Durant. And it worked out pretty good. This is shot with a 400 millimeter up on the second deck. Um, I always shoot sports horizontally, especially basketball. A lot of you might want, you know, a lot of shooters out there when you're first starting, the first thing that you always want to do is shoot vertical, which is great. But I find that I've always found that shooting horizontal for me has shoot more in chances like made more better photos for myself because there's always things that are happening. But also because nowadays our websites really don't really like vertical photos. So we're actually being forced to shoot more horizontal as we speak. So in this instance, I always keep you know, my hand situated like this, and if I need to, I go like that. That way, I can easily switch over. Now, my biggest problem is that if there's a photographer behind me, I might block them, but I try to stay as close as, I keep my arm as close as to me. And of course, this is Beyonce. This is Beyonce saying, no, I don't want my picture. And I, this is, I just put this in because it's one of those instances where you know, famous people, you photograph them in sports a lot, but it's like, I kind of, I don't mind taking their photos. And if even if they say no to it, I still keep going. Mm -hmm. And we go to people, this guy, Andre Godawa is one of the nicest guys you've ever met. And I love photographing him. For a whole year, he hid away from me. And the way he would do it is every time he walked by, he'd put a shirt over his, his face or he'd walk around and he'd turn the other way. And during the playoffs though, he got to actually, I developed a relationship with him, which was really nice. And so just by playing around with him, and then he would shadow box in front of me, have fun with it. And it was a way for him to loosen up before the game. And it's funny how you develop these relationships with these players. Even though I don't sit and talk to them, mentally it's like one of those things where if they see you a lot, they get very comfortable. If they don't know who you are, you just have to work with it a little bit. And then you will be surprised how much things open up. Same thing goes with, uh, you know, with this guy. Uh, it's funny because I have a different photo of him that I used that I, when he stuck his tongue out, but I love this image because he knew what I needed, came up, gave me the Superman pose, and it's nice. Um, a lot of you shoot remotes. I love shooting remotes. It's not, this is probably one of the hardest remotes I can set up. If you've ever done a remote from the ceiling, you would know. Um, I mean, I've learned from some of the best, and, but it has one of, it stresses me out every time I do this. But it produces some wonderful photos if you can get the timing right. And this is Quinn Cook a few years back. And of course, this is LeBron. I think this is this, uh, two years after he started. 
Um, I, I keep this photo because I always, I didn't know at the time who he was. And I don't really follow sports. I, I know it sounds crazy, but I don't go and look at the papers. I mean, I don't look at, I don't follow sports as much as I should. But the reason I keep, I shoot everybody. And this is the reason I'm showing you this is because when you're out there, the best thing you could do is photograph everybody on the team. Everybody will either someday will make something, be something, or maybe not. But I keep this image because it was one of those images that I made when we first started, just like Steph, I had no idea what was gonna happen. Now, a lot of people ask me about this photo and how did I do it? And I always say the same thing. I did it very carefully. Because Kevin Durant is he's very quiet, but he's but he's you know, but at the same time, I have to be really respectful of Kevin Durant when I take these pictures. Um, sometimes I'm involved in this conversation, sometimes I'm not. In this instance, I saw him talking with uh, Bob Myers from the Warriors, and I went up to him and I come, and this is in Houston during the playoffs, and I put the camera down low and I had to I I shot at two eight first, right? And everything was the shoes were a perfect shape, but the background was all blown out, and so I had to work the exposures, and the lighting was horrible. But I ended up shooting it like at f10 at probably 40th of a second, and it worked out really well. But the thing was that I had to get closer and closer, and I was waiting for the moment where he would finally just say, "You know, stop it, get out of here." But he never did. He actually knew what I was trying to do. He he was respectful in that part. I was respectful. I took I did it in one minute. And I was off the floor as soon as I could get it. And this is one of those photos that they always say, like, you always have to be ready. I mean, you always have to be ready on the court when you're shooting. It's nice to have Sanger sit around and talk to your friends and chat and talk to them about, hey, what are you doing? But in this instance, we knew that Prince was had a concert the night before at Oracle, but no one knew if he was going to show up. And one of the ball boys, if you see him in the background, he's smiling. He's the one that told me that said, hey, I saw Prince in the back. I think he's going to come out like right before tip off. So I got ready. I got into my spot and I sat there on my knees waiting for him to come by. Now, I didn't know if he was coming behind me or if he was coming to the side. Lucky for me, Prince is Prince and he walked straight on the court and they let him do whatever he wants. So this is one of those instances where basically, and at first I thought, I swear to God, I thought it was a blind guy walking in. Because he just walks in and he's like tapping his cane. And it was amazing. It was one of the weirdest events ever that I've ever experienced. And, um, and there's a photographer that was to the left of me that nobody was ready. You know, some people were on the floor. They had no idea he was coming. So they never got this shot. It was just pure luck and a little bit of planning, but that I actually was able to make this image. And, of course, LeBron reacting after losing one of the, uh, the finals. This was actually, this is, <laughs> it, it, it's interesting because I, I have to cover two dynamics. I got the Warriors and I got LeBron. So whenever you shoot these two incredible teams, it was hard because you had to make a balance. Of like you make one image, but then you have to go back to the other. So it was really kind of hard because you always have to be like your head's on the swivel. You're always looking for something different. And, and this was one of those instances because it only lasts like a fraction of a second. Just like something like this. So now I'm going to talk to you a little bit about sports and other emotions. And this is one of the things that I love. If you ever got the chance to shoot high school sports, I love high school sports. High school sports to me is I'd rather shoot high school sports than any pro event or any college. Because these kids are really, truly, they, let, they put everything into it. And their emotions really go into it. So this is just basically 7,200 uh, at Sacramento. And this is, this is the state championships. And I love photographing the state championships because they give it their all. And you either make it or you don't. And so this is, gives me a really great opportunity. I've, and I've learned from all these other photographers is to focus the camera lens on the bottom of the net. That way you have a really good opportunity to get all everything in focus. Because in, and you remember, I'm using like five cameras to shoot usually at an NBA game, like in the big games. So I usually use the better cameras with me. So whatever goes up on the ceiling is probably an old D4 or an old D4, like, I don't know, a D4S or God forbid a D2HS or something. Because those are the ones that, you know, you, you, you could spare. But, I, you know, in this instance, you know, you put a converter on if you have to, to get a zoom in, low ISO. So the aperture on it 
is not as much as I'd like to. I wish I could put a D5 up there, but I can't. So this was not shot with a D4S and with a, a 7200 and zoomed in straight down. And, I, and you can zoom in on the back of the LCD screen, preset your focus, and, right, and sometimes it works. And this is one of those instances where I talk, talk to people about shooting. Um, I usually shoot around three to 5,000 images per game. Sounds a lot, right? But the reason I shoot a lot is because I always shoot the beginning of the action, follow the action to the peak of, you know, of action, and then keep following it. And a lot of stuff happens at the end of the, of the, what, the series of the image. In this instance, this is Clay Thompson games, you know, at the uh, final game of the NBA Finals last year. He lands on his left, well, he lands awkward on his left leg and tore, tore his ACL. If you look carefully, that's his ACL being torn right there. And this image would not have been made if I would have stopped as soon as he came down. So that was kind of like, I always want to, I really want to emphasize that, that when you're shooting sports, don't just stop. Keep going. Follow it through. Something's, someone's going to either react to it or they're going to be some kind of an exposure, something happening to it. Same, here's another remote angle. This was in Houston. Nice frame. I got lucky. F, I think I shot an F5 with a 70, 70 to 35 millimeter lens on an old D4, but it worked out okay. Now, this is something I've never seen before. This is a high school kid at the same state ripping his jersey. Um, uh, 300 2.8 straight down. I love the 300 because it gives it, the backdrop, just the background just drops. It's beautiful, it's clean. And also at state championships, usually there's not a lot of kids, apparently family that shows up or a fan. So sometimes your backgrounds are really nice. Uh, I like putting this one in because DeMarcus Cousins, I don't know, he just, uh, he frustrates me. But he makes good photos of him landing on basketballs and crushing them. This is actually the game where he, um, this was in, where was this actually? Toronto. I think it was in Houston. No, it's, it's uh, Kawhi with the new balances there, I see. Oh, wow, okay. <laughs> I love that you know that. So this must have been, yeah. So this, this is uh, when he just came back to play. And I think he got hurt a little bit later after this image. And talking about getting hurt, this is the weirdest, one of the weirdest things is when Durant tore his, you know, his Achilles and then, you know, comes out and it was just, it was surreal. It was like, this is, I've never heard a whole stadium cheering for the injury of a player. And I was really happy to see this. And this was kind of one of those, like, it became a moment, you know, and it was like the injury was a moment, but also this was part of the moment too, because they knew that this is bigger than the game. You know, this is Durant's career. So I, I have the photo of him getting hurt, but I didn't want to show that one. It was, there was really nothing. This was more of an important photo than, than the other one. And of course, now that the NBA um, rotates everybody, I was up on high and I positioned myself by the locker room. So I knew that if anything was going to happen during that game, I wanted to be as close to the locker room to get them coming this way if something happened. So it worked out. High school sports. I always say high school sports is one of my favorite things because in high school sports to shoot, you can do anything you want. Nobody's going to tell you no. You can go and hang out in the front. You can go to the locker room. You can shoot from any end zone. You can even shoot from inside the, you know, where the coaches are. No one's going to tell you anything different. And so that's what kind of like I really want to emphasize. So people are like, well, oh, I want to shoot an NFL game. Well, guess what? When you go to an NFL game, they don't let you go anywhere. They do, but past the 25 and then you get 100 people. High school sports to me is one of those things that I think if you really want to develop your skill and you have all the accessibility, start there, learn your trade and learn how to do things there, and then you move on to college and then the NFL. And it's really a good starting block for you. Um, one of the places I love in football is I love to shoot from the right by the uh, about eight, uh, about I'd say about seven to eight feet from the, uh, the goaltender marker. And it makes really interesting photos for me. I've always liked to shoot there. Normally, I don't like to go any further, but it depends on how crowded the game is. But here's, an, uh, here's a good example of that, especially when, you know, poor Derek Carr never, probably will never get to go to the Super Bowl. I feel bad for him. 
and always keep your eyes open for something happening. This was the rowdy fan that got in trouble with the police in Santa Clara at a 49er game. They actually, he actually tackled, they, they were holding on to him, but he decided to go over the edge and everything just went crazy after this. But this is one of those instances where you stop. The action's there, but, but I think the action was more interesting behind me at the moment. And then another fan who ran onto the field who, <laughs> who the security guy got overwhelmed and just basically got taken out. And I feel bad for this guy, but um, this, is, this is Raider country, man. You got to watch out when you go to Oakland. And here's one of those instances I was talking about high school sports. This is the De La Salle versus Matter Day in here in, uh, down in Southern California. It doesn't mean that you have to be on the field. I like shooting from up above as well. Clean backgrounds, different, different feel, different emotions, different experience, you know. But most importantly, you get such nice clean backgrounds and you still get the feel for it. All right, so you remember this photo? Have you ever seen this? Oh yeah. So this was one of those instances where I was tell people, it's like, I, it was three hours of shooting NFL football for the NFC championship a few years back. And this was the, whoever, whoever won this game was going to the Super Bowl. And everything I shot, all the thousands of photos didn't matter with sh shit. It was the last two minutes of the game. And Sherman jumped up in the air, knocked the ball down, and they went to, and they won. And Crabtree's sitting there waiting. Nothing came towards him. So this is one of those instances where I actually wasn't where I was normally would be. I would normally be over in the end zone, closer to the, on the left side. But because you're the only guy running back and forth, sometimes you don't get what you want. But it turned out really well for me in this instance because it was a clean background. You got both players in the frame. And, and this is actually the first frame I made when it happened. And the rest is basically coming down, catching the ball. But this was, this was probably, this is the decisive moment from that game. 7,200, regular 2.8, probably about a thousandth of a second on 2,500 ISO. Uh, this is a, I think this was a championship game, right? Mm -hmm. Nice photo, good frame, good hit, you know, 400 with a teleconverter, nighttime, worked out. There's the, uh, this is a few, uh, probably a couple hours before the game. I went up and I ran and made some frames. I was working with my friend, Nat Meyer, who's my colleague who I've been shooting with for 20 years. And I, um, I like shooting up above. I especially enjoy being able to shoot something like this with the sun's coming down, make some really photo, nice photos with fireworks. And guys, I really want to emphasize something, especially when I was telling you about high school sports. This is one of those important issues where you, when you photograph something like this, you have to be like, the action sometimes is not as important as what it is a feature-y stuff. In this instance, they were playing a school from Marin, a Catholic school. I had to wait about 15 minutes because this team doesn't score very well, very much. And I had, I sat there and I didn't know it was gonna pay off. The reason I wanna tell you, to show you this is because I dedicated myself to following these nuns for the next 15 minutes. And it was basically either it was gonna work or it wasn't. And to me, it was an amazing photo. I love it because they, when they scored, mm -hmm. I mean, when, how often do you have nuns on a sideline, right? Same thing. You cotton candy sky, beautiful day. Stop shooting sports. Make some nice feature photos. Take your time. Look around. Look at the corners. Same situation. Smoke machine. Everyone sees it, right? But you know, it's a it's a regular photo. It's nice. But I'd rather make a nice photo like this. But that's nice too. Uh, Matt Liner. I photographed this kid in high school. This cracks me up. I always used, like using this because, but I I cop. I hate cropping out. I, I accidentally cropped the referee's knee out, and it's, I always keep this photo because it bugs me. Because I should have, should have shot a little looser. The older I get, it's crazy. the looser I shoot. Because when I first started, I was shooting too tight. And sometimes the reason I'm showing you this is because I always want you to keep an eye out for things around the edges of your images. Because there's always something happening. And this instance, to me, that was more, this nice touchdown, but that was more important to me. And one of the things, a lot of you kids, a lot of people start using cameras, you know, like shooting shutter priority, aperture priority. Those are great, but there's nothing that's going to take over what you have here in your head. Shoot manual. Shoot manual because when you shoot manual, you can make photos like this when stuff like people run into pockets of light. Think a little plan ahead, you know, plan a little bit ahead. 
get your exposure ready. This is I took on a 7200 on the ground, on my stomach, waiting for the football team to get into a pocket of light. And when it separated with the shadow, it was a perfect, one of those perfect images that I really liked. And, you know, you can't even tell the other teams even there because they're wearing dark colors. But it was one of those things where you take advantage of that light when you have that opportunity. But, you know, playing football. I just love tattoos. This is made at the Super Bowl. I didn't see this frame when I first shot it, but it was through the edit process that I finally saw it when I went back a week later. This was a Super Bowl in San Diego. I was photographing, I was waiting for Jerry Rice to show up because he was late, because he's Jerry Rice. And Lincoln Kennedy was walking by. And mind you, my, I was shooting manual. Everything was manual. So I was shooting like F13, 250th, because I expected Jerry Rice walking in front of me about six feet away. Lincoln Kennedy walks by and decides to step on me. I'm on my stomach, so I'm shooting like this. And I just, I had only a second to react and I flashed it. But it's, it's, but remember back then when we shot with these crazy D1Hs, the, uh, the sensor crop was like this much now. And this was on a 17 millimeter lens. So this is as wide as it got. This is a nice Kaepernick photo. I love this image. Look at the tension on it. It's got this flow. Everybody on the right has got, they're up in the air. He's got, he's got the ball and, you know, right there and it's bending the pole. I just, this is one of my favorite sports enzyme to, to, uh, and it's clean. If you look, it's just clean. Same thing with this one. But if you guys, I want everyone to look at this guy's ankle, number 64 or 84, I can't tell. If you look at his ankle, is it supposed to turn that way? No. So I shot this frame, but I never noticed the ankle into post-production when I was capturing the image. He basically, well, I knew he, when he got up, he started hobbling. I did not know he had basically broken it. So this is one of those instances, you know, nice. I, I finally, I saw it after, but I went back. Same thing, nice catch. Did he catch it? Don't know, don't remember, but it makes for a nice frame. And at the end, this is at the Super Bowl at this year. Um, this is one of those instances where I got very lucky capturing this image because I stuck with, I stuck with um, Jimmy G at the end. Um, it was crazy. It's at the end of the Super Bowl. You know, Mahone, he got, he's celebrating. Jimmy comes over to say hi to him and say congratulations, but he can't get into him. So he walks away. So I stay with, uh, I stay with Garoppolo. And then he hears his name called, turns around and comes back. Well, if I would have given up on it, I would never have been able to make this frame because there was to have been 35 other photographers on my back shoulder making this image. But I was the one right there in front because I never gave up and I stayed with them. So that's one of the things, you know, when you, when you basically know this is, your, this is the shot you want, you can't let go of it just because you think it's going to be in. Stay with it and follow it until you, either you make that image or you don't. Baseball, love baseball. This is just a nice splash photo. I love it how it looks like the Gatorade's the stars in the sky. I got a little wet, but that's okay. Worth it. Yeah, totally worth it. And this is Ichiro, right? If you guys have, you know, he doesn't play anymore, but this was a shot that I really wanted to make with him because he has a routine. And one of the biggest things that in sports that you ever watch is people with their routines. And if you get to um, watch them so much that you kind of get – I usually sit in the first base well, but this for this photo, I needed to go in the third base well. And so I was trying, it was, a, it, was a, it was a hot day, but I knew that everyone was gonna have different colors, right? So these are Oakland A's fans, but I went down there, 2.8, wide open, shot it with on my stomach shooting up, trying to get the fans, and they basically made this beautiful collage of color. And um, it worked out. But at the same time, it was very hard because I was trying to focus from the ground level without those little LCDs that pop up on an old D4, worked out. Same thing, all-star game. This is one of those instances you'll never ever see again. Look at these all, how many all-star players. So it's really important when you're out there, even though this is not really a frame, a photo that you'd ever really use for anything, it's nice for, for documenting history, you know? Broken bat, Milton Bradley, follow through. Oh, you know, you got to love that evening light, right? Beautiful. 400 with a teleconverter, center field, worked out. Didn't need the ball. Sometimes you need the ball, great. If you get the ball, great. If you don't, beautiful sun, sun you know, sunlight will make everything much better.
And this is Aaron Judge in, San, in Oakland. Um, I converted this to black and white because I didn't, I just, I saw, all I saw was freckles when I shot this in color, but I shot him in the dugout with a 7200, really tight. And when I converted it, I was like, wow, look at this. This is amazing. I love this portrait. And he's not even paying attention to me. Uh, in the D5, you get multiple ex exposures. Night game, right when the sun's about a little low, with Justin Verlander when he came to visit us over in Oakland. Now, I don't, haven't seen double plays in a while because nowadays players run out of the baseline, right? But to me, this is nothing says up, shooting from up above, down, double play. And, um, you know, it's, it's beautiful. And this is one of those instances where I always carry a wide angle with me. And so this is, I, I basically carried a wide angle camera. A, oh, I always carry a wide with me. These guys commandeered a video camera. And what they were doing was that they were looking at fans in the audience and they're checking out uh, women. And okay, this is a D1. You guys are all young. I shot, I started with a D1 camera. Look at the, look how pixelated this is. This is against the Yankees. Now, when you shot with the D1 back in those days, there was a one second, almost one second uh, time lapse. Like if you push the shutter, it took a whole second for it to happen. It was brutal because that meant you had to shoot before the play even happened. So this is one of those instances. And nowadays, you can shoot that sucker as much as you want and get bad on ball. And there you go. Same thing with double plays. Oh, I love shooting NHRA. If anyone's ever got the opportunity, it's amazing. But at the same time, it scares the shit out of you. Oh, by the way, yeah, if you notice, those are parts flying up. And they will hit you. So that's why it's so dangerous to photograph this event. But it's, it's intense. Motocross. X Games, back when there was X Games here in San Francisco. Clean background, nice light, makes a big world of difference. Uh, Pebble Beach. Now, listen, Michael, you're, you're the king of shooting golf. Mm -hmm. I basically sit back and watch this stuff. But when you shoot Pebble Beach early morning, get, your app, get up early. You shoot the beautiful light. Mm -hmm. Look for those things that everybody, you know, everybody, there'll be other people shooting the tight shot with him. I waited back about, this is the 18th green at Pebble. I waited back about 300 yards for this because I saw the fog roll in and it was a perfect, beautiful moment. And I thought this was kind of what Pebble Beach is. Same thing, Bill Murray. This is when he actually won it the first time. I've been covering Bill Murray for 14 years. He's never won. And this was the first time he ever won. Look at that face. Amazing. Yeah. Gunga, 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 ding. <laughs> and uh, high school sports, I say it again. How many times will a duck fly into a, 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 a swim meet and swim with the swimmers? Not very often. I love this photo. This is shot on film. 200, I think it was 200 ISO, 7200 on a Nikon F5. Olympic trials, broken, you know, always shoot through. Don't stop. Even, even after, follow it through. Broken pole vaulter. Never, never seen that happen, ever. Uh, rodeo. I love rodeo. Easy to shoot. And last but not least, I want to show you, I'm leaving, this is the last series. This is Metallica playing a concert in San Quentin prison. Wow. First of all, they sent a press release. They said, get here in one hour. And I'm like, I live one hour. Well, I live 40 minutes from San Quentin. So I got there as fast as I could. This was a free concert for San Quentin prisoners because they filmed a video called For St. Anger. I'm telling you, I was never so scared in my life because look at this. These guys, <laughs> they're, you're in, I'm in San Quentin prison shooting a concert. This is intense. And there's guards everywhere. And the only rule was that I wasn't allowed to go into the population behind them because I was trying to photograph them both together, but I couldn't do it. So I tried to do the best from what I can. You know, they got guys up in, you know, with rifles up in the uh, upstairs. And then these guys are, having, ah, you know, and it was the sur most surreal. Danny Trujillo had just joined, you know, so it was pretty intense, but it was amazing. And I will never forget, this is one of the craziest assignments I've ever had. Metallica and San Quentin Prison. All right, so thanks. For, that's my slideshow presentation. And by the way, please, everyone, any question you have, I, there's no silly questions, ask me anything. And I hope you enjoyed what I have to show you. Yeah, I'm gonna keep awesome. stop sharing. There you go. Yeah, that's great.
Um, yeah, so I'll kind of facilitate. Um, we got one um, question from Josh, Mr. Josh Barber here. Um, he said, question about the overhead remotes. Are you stopping down or shooting wide open when focusing? Are you using your view, view of the net or able to have someone hold a focus target? Have you ever thought using a crop body for remotes? So, um, I have thought about using a crop body for remotes, but the only problem is because those crop, they're really kind of, I don't, I have some old D200 still, but I don't really use them the image is so bad so what I do is basically um, I'll set up everything already um, I use a lot of masking tape and when I set up the remote I don't focus until everything is basically I, I say I set it up with the framing first I make sure that everything is framed the way I want it and then it's a, I usually shoot it at probably f5 that's why um, I want to get the best camera I have but sometimes that doesn't work out because you have to hire a really high ISO and so usually f5 at a a 500th of a second, and um, and sometimes I will use a, t a teleconverter, but mostly I, uh, I'll i keep it at 7200, at zoomed in at 200, and I focus actually using the back of the screen um, as uh, through the viewfinder. I, I don't look through the viewfinder, but I look the back of the screen to zoom in, and then I set the pre-focus that way. Um, sometimes Adam, if everyone knows the NBA Finals, you hang out with Adam, um, Adam will go down for uh, for Andy Bernstein and, and hold something to pre-focus, but sometimes I don't get there in time, and so I'll pre just pre-focus on the bottom of the net. And nine out of ten times, that's pretty good where it works out for me. That's awesome. Um, one of the questions for me that I had written out. So, um, well, as you as as I'm sure you will not attest to, but I will attest for you. You are one of the nicest guys of all time, and um, I think that really plays into your photos, and you can see that. What, what is the value in over your career, you know, you like meeting the people on the fringes and, you know, like for me and I, I, you know, I find myself doing this, how often I show up and just headphones in, don't talk to anybody, just take pictures. And I, you know, that's something I've seen you do and you're talking about even here, but your relationships with security guards with um, building with players and people on the edges that, you know, get that authentic moment kind of speak to that. Cause I think that can, you know, benefit a lot of us. Oh yeah. Guys, listen, I sometimes bring cookies from the media room and I give to security people and I walk around the whole arena and I make friends with people. And especially like is at the warriors because an events where you're basically always hearing the word, no, mm -hmm. the relationship you build where they know who you are opens doors for you to make these photos. And so that's one of the most important things I could tell you is that when I go to these events, especially I actually made friends and um, this is so funny. The first, my first time I ever shot at Cleveland in uh, Cleveland Cavaliers NBA Finals, I made a friends with my friend Andy, uh, who is one of the security. He's not security. He's one of the guys that sits you down, you know. And and he his spot where he is is one of the best spots to shoot from up above, but nobody's allowed there. And so what I did was I promised him photos after you know from LeBron so he could give to his nephews, and he said, you know what, you could sit here as much as you want. And that actually opened up so many opportunities. But the reality is nowadays, you just have to be really polite and nice. And, but I mean, if that's your, who you are, that's great. But it, for me, it allows me to get into places I'm not supposed to be in. And so, um, and, that, and, and then later on, these people, I know it sounds crazy, but these security people, they don't just work one arena. They actually work in different arenas. Like they'll go work at Oakland Coliseum. They'll work over at AT&T Park. So I get to meet them later and we still keep friends and it, it, it works out for me. That's awesome. Um, James question here from Mr. Gilbert. Uh, yeah. What was your other shooters assignment post game for Super Bowl this year? Um, I guess Nat, how did you two approach deciding what to do amid the chaos once the clock hit zero? Like what you maybe talk about Super Bowl and like, and you know, I know for a lot of us that are on here, um, you know, some of us are, you know, wire shooters, some of us are whatnot. Can you kind of talk about a newspaper's approach to it? Because you have, you know, you have writers requests to uh, yeah. satisfy so, also the newspaper. So one of the things, this is the, this is what they give you at the Super Bowl. And it has a number on the back. It says zero, zero, zero. So this was important because at the end of the game, you were allowed to run onto the field immediately after the game. While other jerseys would say two, zero, zero for two minutes. So you had to make up your decision. I'm going to be the one running in, so I won't be able to be shooting as I'm running. 
So Nat would position himself on the end zone. We'd work as a team. And he would shoot with a 400 and a teleconverter across shooting the reaction. And I would shoot with a 7200 and a, and well, yes, a 1424 and a 7200. And so while I'm walking, I'm still shooting with the 7200, but at the same time, I'm keeping an eye open for everything that's happening. So in this instance, as newspapers, we have to work together just like a wire photographers. So we plan everything before the actual event. And we sit down, we talk about, the most important thing actually we talk about is deadline. So we actually, because after the event, after like this celebration or dejection, we only have less than 15 minutes to sh or even less, like 10 minutes to shoot this and start sending. Yeah. And much like wires, we don't have somebody to give it to, to run back. We have to do it all ourselves. So one of the important things for us is basically keep a mental tr idea of what you have on that card. And we don't even download. I mean, when I, I put it into the card reader, I don't download everything. I just keep it on that card so I can move faster. Caption, everything's already set, preset captions and everything. And the one thing that I hate doing this is I always forget, I always forget the score. So what I do at every game is I take a pen at the end and I write it on my hand the score at the end of the game. And so that helps me move faster because if my editors back in California see an AP photo, the first, or a Getty photo, the first thing I'll get is a text message that says, do you have this photo? And I'm like, maybe i don't know i'm still running so my that's one of those one of those instances where it drives me nuts like yeah. real quick you, you remember the 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 oakland raiders game where uh jesus when they're playing the patriots when he the tuck rule yeah, mm -hmm. yeah i never saw it <laughs> i was in the end zone covered in snow i was freezing i never saw it but i got what are you gonna do yeah where is it yeah um, a question from Stan. Starting in sports photography, who did you look up for inspiration? Um, maybe, maybe both starting, but also now. You know, like what what keeps your creative mind going? And you know, kind of talk about who inspired you, but also when you get in lulls and you know we get you know tired these days. What do you use as inspiration? Who do you look at? Stuff like that. Oh, that's a really good question because when I first started, you guys got to remember when I first started, I was shooting a, um, rolls of film. Mm -hmm. And you, we didn't have Twitter. We didn't have any of those situations. So what I would do is I would go on the wire and look at AP shooters. And um, Getty wasn't even around back then. It was called um, Osport. 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 So we, I would basically go through and the wires and, and watch and see how other people shot. And I would use that and copy their style. And it's okay to copy someone's style. It's okay to look at what they do, how they shoot things. And then when you, and you can copy it as much as you want and give them credit later and say, look what I did. Because the, what I really want you guys to learn about is like, is the ability to make mistakes. And that's one of the biggest things is because I, I know when I first started, my biggest concern when I was making pictures was I was freaking out that, oh my God, I'm going to miss a photo, right? If you're out there taking pictures, the first thing you're like, ah, I hope I don't miss a photo today. How about this? When you're out there, oh, wow, I cannot believe, I can't wait to make these images. They're going to be amazing. Mm -hmm. Have fun with it. Because I'd be like this, you know, that's like, like the old blazing saddles. Yeah, but this is my shooting hand, right? So you're like, it's okay to be nervous. But when I started, when like the minute would get down to two minutes or one minute, your heart starts racing and you're like freaking out. You're full of fear because you're afraid you're going to miss something. Well, here's the best part. You're going to miss it no matter what. If you get it, you have to get over that part and have more confidence in yourself. And so when I started taking pictures, I realized that I started having more fun when I let that go. And yeah. so I followed um, for baseball, Jose Luis Viegas from the Sacramento Bee. Man, pick up his book. He, this guy is amazing. I'm looking to see if I have it here. He followed a lot of the Oakland A's players when they were kids. He did all these incredible behind the scenes stories way before it was, before it was cool to do. Yeah. Um, for and for ba you know for us over here for football and stuff like that, I watched Peter, Peter Reed Miller was a big you know big big time for me, and um, and his assistant was Kojo Kohiro Kino, and him uh, I basically followed them those guys when I first started because I loved the way they shot Peter Reed Miller, uh, Brad Nanjin, all these guys, and so but the only thing was that. There was no Instagram. There was no Twitter. There was no Facebook. There was nothing. It was all basically Sports Illustrated. And so that's how I kept going through that stuff. Nowadays, 
I look at through, um, actually on pe your friends, I go through Instagram and I look at see people's work and I really, there's, there's incredible stuff happening out there. Not right now, but from what's happening before, I like seeing things differently through people, young people's eyes because they're trying different things with cameras that, you know, with tilt focused lenses and stuff like that, that I've never seen before in my life. So I like that. That's what inspires me to keep going. Um, somebody said starting out in sports photography, uh, beside on on-field experience, do you recommend any online courses? So, I mean, maybe, maybe today, and I, I know um, you have an example of this is, oh, did I freeze? Hang on. Um, maybe talk about for, you know, some of the new young people, like what are some resources to look into? And like when building a portfolio, what, what are yeah. things they should look for? And you talked about high school sports, maybe, maybe dive into that and say, Hey, if I want like, say I was brand new today, what would you tell me to dive into, to look into in high school sports wise? Okay. Well, right now, I, one of the things when I first started was there's, and actually it's going on right now is Eddie Adams. Mm -hmm. Eddie Adams was an opportunity, was a, is a workshop produced by the associate, former associate press photographer, Eddie Adams, who passed away a long time ago, but I was able to meet him in, in 2001, right? Actually, I went to Eddie Adams during 9-11. And so one of the most amazing things that I learned from there was um, you get a group of 10, you know, a, a team of 12 to 13 people and you learn underneath uh, an, an advisor. So one of those, some of those workshops are really, really informative, but the, the, the ability is though, like I just, I also do sports shooter as well with Bert, Ken, uh, with Bert Hanashiro. And I love these events because I, you spent, you, you, people are almost afraid to ask questions. Like you worry that you're going to offend yourself, offend somebody, or you sound like you're stupid about something. There is no stupid question. And I'd rather be able to you know, show you how I did it and learn from that. Um, but I mostly did Eddie Adams and Sports Shooter when I first started. And what I do, and one of the biggest things I really want to emphasize, like I said, with sports, shooting sports, was going to these events where you go to, if you can get into high school sports, like, um, you can always possibly get into a high school game. Yeah. Um, uh, but basically, if you don't have that accessibility, uh, become a member of MPPA as a student and get their press credential. That way you have something that you can say, hey, look, this is what I'm doing. And, you know, but be honest. Don't say like, oh, I'm shooting for this people. Mm -hmm. I have actually told people before, if you do shoot for somebody, shoot for your local newspaper. Uh, work as a stringer starting out like that you know and that gives you the opportunities to open doors and I always said to some other friends that basically um, send editors at these newspapers your photos to show them that you're doing stuff examples of the work that you're doing that will open it's not it might not open doors right away but it shows them that you're actually producing things and follow that you know um, and follow them up with an email maybe a, a week later or something but to show them that you're, you're producing things and if they like it, they're going to start, they're going to call you. It's great. Now, right now though, is a weird time, right? Yeah. It's going to be hard. This is not, there's a lot of like little kids, things are starting to open up, but not as much as you want. Right. So, but when things go back to normal, you will have that opportunity because it's going to be, there's going to be a lot of, a lot of people want to do sports. You just got to, but don't ever give your stuff away for free. That's one thing I would say. Don't give it away for free. I, your work is important. It means something to you. It's, it, it's crucial that you keep the copyright of those images to yourself because you never know when you're going to need them later. Absolutely. Of course. Um, had an in intro question from Mr. Julio Cortez. Asked this on Instagram. He, <laughs> wants know, he wants to know about your lust for Steph Curry. There's no lust. I just follow the guy because... He's a really nice guy, actually. I wanted to hop on here and ask you. Yeah, that. I saw that. No, that's me. So whenever someone – Steph Curry was the kind of guy that when I first started shooting, nobody gave a rat's ass about him. Nobody. Yeah. Except maybe me. I mean, we – but, by you know, if you follow – to me, following him is kind of like one of those things where you see a, someone who succeeded. But if you ever met him in person, he's one of the nicest people. And he, he addresses you by your first name. Yeah. yeah, I mean, maybe, maybe talk about that. What, how is your relationship with athletes? Because, I mean, it'd be, you know, for someone that's only been shooting for two years or whatnot, it's, your relationship with athletes is going to build over time. And someone, you know, you've been in there a while and seeing him from when he was a rookie to now, how has that relationship with him developed into making, you know, more authentic photos, I guess? More. Well, that's a, that's a really, like, whenever the team travels, they don't, 
um, like say when we went to the Spurs or when we go to Houston or when we went to, I, I go to the team practices and, and basically during those team practices, the team actually doesn't like they'll, they'll herd people away from them. And when they see me walk up, actually they don't bug me at all. They let me do whatever I want. I'll go up there and I'll be with a wide load of the ground where I'll be hanging out with the players and I'll make some pictures, but I'm respectful in that respect that I don't, they're busy working. Right. But when they're done, they're listening to music or whatever. I'll just say, Hey, how's it going? Like I had a discussion with Kevin Durant once when he was saying about when he was in college in Texas, that he used to sleep on an air mattress. And I replied, you mean two air mattresses because you were not going to fit on one mattress. And so these relationships are built slowly mm -hmm. because you don't want to go in there because they're very defense. They're very protective of their surrounding right. circle. Now, what happens though, is that when you're in that circle that like, I would never have been able to make that Durant photo with the feet if I was just some guy that just walked up. That mm -hmm. took, that was two years of just being at practice every yeah. day for them to get that relationship. So um got time for one or two more questions here any um any questions feel free to unmute yourself if you want to ask aloud or yeah. um ask jose anything um, um if not i can pull up some questions or um anybody got any there um uh, no worries if not i can throw something i'm gonna show you my first camera hold on let's see it wow. so let's go it's an old f3 the battery's dead but it's still, you know, still an iCat. Oh, so when you guys first started, we used to shoot with digital cameras that if the battery died, it died. You had to plug the damn thing in with a cord that plugged into here <laughs> to shoot digital way, way back when. So this is like, and you only got 36 frames. So if you shot 36, 35, you were, you know, you were done. It didn't, it took time. So those are the days. Anybody have questions? Um, I'll ask one, um, talk about, um, cause I, I know you do some of this is long storm stories and, um, some of that breaking news stuff is how do you find some of those? Like, I guess news wise breaking news, they're probably contacting you from writers. Maybe talk about that, the relationship with writers and um, working in meetings and some of that. Yes. Yeah, so especially well in sports real quick. I do have a relationship with the sports writers because a lot of the stuff that we do is that they're upstairs in the press box and they're listening or they're, they're, they're watching the game. They'll text me all the time during the game and tell me, Hey, someone broke an ankle. Hey, someone did this. Keep an eye out for this. So um, that's really important to have a really good relationship with your writers as for news side and everything else, like all those fires and stuff like that. Um, basically, uh, we're news photographers. We have to be ready to go at the moment's notice. So I carry everything with me. Everything I got in my car um, is ready to go. Everything's charged every morning. Um, I use, you know, I carry, I know it sounds crazy, but like I carry five cameras with me every day because I never know if one breaks, but I, for sporting events, usually between five to seven cameras. And they're not the greatest, but some of them, you know, but the, my core, what I use, um, I always have with me. So. Great. Sweet. Well, um, feel free to drop any questions here. Um, I'm sure Jose is the man and would love to answer any additional questions, whether it's Instagram DM or um, if you want to send an email, I can put that out and you can say your email if you'd like. Um, but um, really appreciate Jose taking the time today. And um, oh wait, yeah. Can so someone asked me, do I have an editor for big games? Yeah. No, I don't, I don't, no. <laughs> this, is, this is your editor. This is your editor. So you guys know about, uh, you guys know about locking your camera, right? When you shoot, you basically tag your images, tag, 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 and voice tag. That is the most important thing I can tell you. You have to edit through the camera when you have a break. So whenever you're shooting NBA, especially with three cameras on you, you have to be take care of those timeouts. Don't shoot the cheerleaders. Stay shooting. Your, you know, concentrate and tag your images while you're doing. You have like a minute, thirty seconds, whatever, because. When we're on the road, I got um, Nat above. And Nat and I rotate. Nat and I have been doing this for 20 years as teammates. Mm -hmm. And he gets mad at me. I get mad at him. But it's like a love-hate relationship. And it's like he's like my brother. But it's one of those incredible things because whenever I feel like I miss something, I know that he's got it. And so that's kind of – that's a really nice experience. Love that. That's awesome. Is there time for one more question? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Throw it out there, of course. I have one, too, so if you get a second. Go for it. What's up? Uh, okay. Jose, one of the reasons I really admire you is 
beyond your photography, I think that you are very open about being like as photographers we are human beings and then photographers do you want to talk about kind of like like i know you've you've advocated for taking care of your body and your mind do you want to talk about about like what you think why you think that's important yeah it's really important um in 2014 i suffered a uh a herniated disc in my neck a c5 c6 and i had to go um i was out for a month and it gave me severe anxiety and so one of the things which, if you've ever had anxiety, um, I had not. And so anxiety basically overtook me. The problem was that I still had to do my job. And if you look at what I've done, uh, I actually shot four NBA finals with anxiety. I shot three Super Bowls with anxiety and two World, Ch World, uh, two World Series with anxiety. So a lot of it was basically me not sleeping. And so one of the things I really wanted to tell you guys is that um, when you're shooting, you kind of get in the mode where you basically stop thinking about other things. And to me, photography allowed me to basically concentrate on something besides myself. And so that allowed me to take care of myself and not worry about it because, but it was the hardest thing to do because, you know, it's like you go on autopilot for the rest, all your life. And, I, and I'm really trying to tell the mental state, especially now, it's really hard. Um, and I've always tried to take, and I've always told everybody, if there's a problem that you need to talk to, we're all here for you. And I'm, especially me, I will be here. If you need to message me through anything, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, let me know. And I'll, I'll take your phone call because someone did it for me as well. So, because when I was on the road covering these, you're on your, imagine being on the road for, a month by yourself covering these events. You have nobody to talk to sometimes late night. So one of the things that, you know, was really for me was these relationships I build with these other photographers on the road where I met everybody, a lot of these good people. Um, and the, the team photographers at every arena I've been to have been amazing and people that you travel with because what happens is those people become your family. And so, and I have, I have never experienced an instance where in the Bay Area where, you're shooting next to somebody and you elbow somebody or punch. And this happens all the time, but everyone looks at each other and says, are you okay? Are you doing all right? Like if you fall over, we'll, we'll pick you up and help you out no matter what. So to me, that was really important. So whenever I'm on the road, uh, I call people that I'm that who I friends there and I meet up for dinner or lunch and I, and I have breakfast and I made a point of making sure that everyone's doing okay. And so that's one of the things that um, that is even just as important as the images I make was building those relationships because whenever I travel, I, I just love seeing them again and again. Of course, somebody else have one more. I heard. Hey, I got yeah, one. I had a quick question about trying to you know I guess from my perspective getting to the next level. I've, I I yes. started high school photograph sports photography. Now I'm doing a lot of uh, like D three and junior college sports photography. You know, what's the road? I mean, I want to get, you know, into like more faster paced action, just, you know, pretty much the next level. Any wisdom or guidance on, you know, where to go? I mean, I'm down here in the SoCal area, so okay. pretty competitive out here. So, yeah, you're in a very heavy market down in this LA County because there's the one thing I could suggest is maybe finding some kind of a weekly newspaper or a weekly public magazine or something that you will get your foot through the door because nowadays, websites they ask for more than just you know if it's just a website or not and those things are publication editorial because a lot of organizations are now being like well you know if you work for advertorial department now we don't need you but editorial they want all the basically they want you know they want to put their names out there and so i i would find that find trying to find that niche and basically have portfolios of yourself your stuff ready and email them, you know, not like you overwhelm them, but let them know that you're doing these things and keep doing those things. Like, you know, even if the case where if you, sh um, if you're shooting like a junior college, get in touch with their media relations, you know, and say, Hey, if you guys mind, would you like posting some of my images and just credit it back to me on my Instagram account, but you, here's these images that you are for yourself. And, you know, as long as you don't use it for, you know, for publication in the sense where like, you know, uh, for magazines or anything like that, but at least that gives them the opportunity because pe most most of the times they're dying for people's access, you know, for especially on Instagram and Twitter nowadays. Mm -hmm. So I mean, there is no great answer to give you because right now your market where where you're at is very saturated. Like, 
like but in the bay area it's a little different but still nowadays there's a lot of kids coming up and you know they're you know it's hard it, it is really hard i have to tell you great any other questions anything any you advice? want to say jose any 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 closing words any um advice general you know, you know, one of the things that I, I um, if I can ever raise up hands, like who here shoots when you shoot? I mean, are you happy? Are you having fun shooting? Right? You're having fun shooting? Exactly. That's the thing. Like, so when you're out there, hi, Shay. So when you're out there, it's like one of the things, like when you're shooting with somebody else, make friends with those other photographers because I've made so many friends with those long that they've basically have opened up these doors. I met Michael. Uh, because my friend Tom Pennington invited us to dinner and I have made a long, I, and Tom Pennington is one of the nicest, most talented photographers and he's so laid back and he's just relaxed. So one of the things I all I ask is basically when you're out there, think about what you're doing, but also think about the other people because everyone has those same feelings and what they're shooting. Make friends, make friends and talk about what you're doing. And then that will open a lot more doors than just, you know, you'll, you'll see so I appreciate you taking the time and listening to, to me. And I, I, I know I blab a lot, but um, I, I appreciate you guys taking the time to, uh, to watch and look at my stuff and taking it and listen. Awesome. awesome. Well, thank you so much. If you want to drop a comment down in the chat and say thank you, um, Jose, I, I'm sure he would really appreciate that. And um, just want to say thanks for joining today. Um, as, as I said, the Slack link is there in the chat. Um, if you'd like to shoot me, Jose, or anybody a question, we'd love to um, connect with you and um, talk and anything we can do during this crazy time to help and support one another. That's why we're here and um, thankful for everybody hopping on. This will be posted on YouTube. So if you know anyone that can use some encouragement or some guidance from Mr. Jose here, would love if you'd share the video and um, any of that. So we'll try to do this again on maybe Friday. If not, we can um, maybe do next Monday as well. Um, look forward to having you all. You all are awesome, and um, have a great day. Thanks, guys. Appreciate Thank it. You. What? Trying to be, um, I don't know. I was being sunny. I was acting like I was frozen. <laughs> All right. Peace. Later, man.